So thanks. Uh, do you hear me? Wait. Yeah, all good. Okay, so I will play. So thanks, Irene, for the introduction. And before I start, I'd like to thank the Journal of Development for giving me the opportunity to present my, present my work. So my study focuses on the signaling role of metabolism. And today I'd like to talk about whether metabolism plays an instructive rather than permissive role in regulation of phenotype. So our group is interested in how signal dynamics is controlled and how such dynamics encode spatial temporal information during embryonic patterning. And to study these questions, we are using mass somatogenesis as one of the model system. So some mites are known to be segmented from a tissue called pesomatic mesoderm or PSM in a periodic fashion. So in case of, in case of mass embryos, every two hours, new soul mites are formed. This temporal periodicity is controlled by a molecular clock known as a, known as a segmentation clock. And this comprises of the notch, FGF, and wind signaling pathway in mice. Here, I show you the movie of notch signaling reporter, Lou Belou, in PSM cells. And I think, and it's clear that notch signaling activity is oscillating within PSM. And this periodic activation of notch is happening every two hours, which corresponds to the timing of mass segmentation. And why the core molecular machinery comprising the clock are well described so far, we still don't know what controls the tempo of the clock. And I started to explore metabolism as a potential regulator. And at the moment, I'm particularly interested in the role of glycolysis because we have previously shown that active glycolysis is required for segmentation clock oscillation. And to study the role of glycolysis, I first established this transgenic mass line in which you can activate glycolysis in a genetic manner. So I don't explain the detail, but the trick is we overexpress this dominant active form of PFKV3, or what we call site PFKV3, and this enzyme activates the rate limiting step of glycolysis, which is PFK reaction. And in this, indeed, then this genetic trick was sufficient to increase glycolytic flux in PSM cells. And here I show you the data of lactate secretion from Y-type and transgenic PSM expand. And then you can see TG has two times higher lactate secretion compared to the Y-type. And another key message here is lactate secretion was glucose dose dependent. So by increasing glucose, you can also activate glycolysis both in Y-type and TG. So then I investigated how cytopiacal 3 overexpression impact the segmentation clock dynamics using not signaling reporter Lubelu. So as you can see in this movie, in both control and TG, not signaling activity was oscillating beautifully, showing a wave-like pattern propagating from posterior to the anterior. So at the first look, there was no qualitative difference between them. And then I was quite excited to find a temporal difference between them. So I quantified the period of not signaling oscillation, and I found that TG has 20% longer period compared to the control. So higher glycolysis led to slower clock. And this clock tempo phenotype must be able to rescue by culturing them in the lower glucose concentration. So this data suggests that segmentation clock tempo is responding to glycolytic flux rather than cytopfkv protein itself. And indeed, even in Y-type embryos, by titrating glucose from 0.5 to 10 millimolar, I was able to slow down the segmentation clock. So combined, these data show that glycolytic flux tune the tempo of segmentation clock. So then I started to explore the potential link between glycolysis and the segmentation clock. And I decided to focus on wind signaling in particular because I have previously recently shown that glycolytic flux tune the activity of wind signaling. So higher flux leads to lower wind activity while lower flux leads to higher wind activity. And when explore, so wind activity and the clock tempo were both tunable by changing the glycolytic flux. So in this sense, wind, uh, wind signaling seems to be a good candidate connecting glycolysis and the clock tempo phenotype. And when exploring this possibility, I also wanted to ask whether the role of metabolism is instructive or permissive. And to distinguish these two possibilities, I decided to manipulate wind signaling directly by deleting a wind antagonist called DCOF1 or DKK1. 
So the idea here is the KK1 deletion should be able to rescue the clock phenotype if the law of glycolysis is interactive. Because in this case, wind signaling activity is a bottleneck from the, for the clock tempo. On the other hand, if the law of glycolysis is permissive, the KK deletion would not rescue the tempo because in this case, flux is the bottleneck for the clock tempo. And here is the data. So as I presented in the previous slide, overexpression of site of PFK3 led to the slower clock. But now excitingly, if you delete one allele of DKK1, you can rescue the clock tempo. And importantly, I confirmed that DKK1 deletion is not affecting glycolytic activity. So this data suggests DKK deletion can rescue the clock tempo without rescuing metabolic phenotype. And this data fits nicely with the idea that the role of glycolysis is instructive rather than permissive. And then building on this finding, I further explored whether glycolytic flux can function as an instructive signaling cue to synchronize or entrain the segmentation clock oscillations. We previously established this microfluidics-based entrainment system in which you can culture PSM expand in an uh, alternating culture condition to synchronize the segmentation clock oscillation between embryos. So normally the segmentation clock are not in sync between embryos. So if you plot the median value of non-signaling reporter across embryos over time, you get flat line because they are not in sync. But now if you apply a signaling modulator like not inhibitor in a periodic fashion to the system, you can synchronize the segmentation clock between embryos, which is visible in the medium plot. And for me, the question was whether periodic perturbation of glycolysis can function as a, like a signaling modulator to synchronize the clock oscillation. And I found this system very elegant because we can integrate the epistasis between metabolism and signaling in white type embryos using transient metabolic perturbations instead of clonic metabolic perturbation. So I first tested very simple culture conditions. So we changed the glucose concentration from two millimolar to 0.5 millimolar every 140 minutes. And we asked such change of perturbation can synchronize the segmentation clock. And I was super excited to find that that is the case. So this gentle perturbation of glycolytic flux can synchronize the segmentation clock. And I also found that periodic pulse of glycolytic intermediate called fructose 1,6 bisphosphate or FPP can also do the same job. So today I don't have time to talk about the FPP too much, but previously we have revealed that FPP functioned as a sentinel for glycolytic flux. So this means FPP levels correlate with glycolytic flux within the cells. And now if you part up that metabolite in a periodic fashion, you can synchronize the segmentation clock. And this synchronization, synchronization behavior can be described using a quantitative reader such as Kuramoto first order parameter. This is a proxy for our in-phase synchrony. So in case of constant culture condition, which shown in gray, this parameter stays low because no synchronization, synchronization is happening. But now if you expose the system to alternative glucose condition, which is shown in blue, the parameters start to increase, meaning synchronization is kicking in in this condition. And such synchronization happens much faster with periodic pass of FPP. So this data shows that glycolytic flux can function as an instructive signaling cue to synchronize the segmentation clock. And now I further ask whether wind signaling behaves differently in this context compared to the not signaling per se. So this is because as I briefly mentioned in the introduction, wind signal pathway is also a part of the segmentation clock. And my data so far suggests that glycolytic flux instructs the segmentation clock tempo via wind signaling pathway. So I wondered whether wind signaling behaves differently compared to the not signaling in this context. So we did a FPP enchainment using wind signaling reporter and I was quite surprised to find that wind signaling oscillation gets entrained or synchronized one or two cycles before not signaling oscillation. So this data suggests glycolytic flux entrained the segmentation clock rhythm via wind signaling. And it also suggests that glycolytic flux, glycolytic flux signaling has some specificity. 
So in conclusion, I show that glycolysis plays an instructive role in regulation of wind signaling. And such glycolysis wind signaling axis is tuning the tempo of segmentation clock. And now I want to explore the function of such glycolysis wind signaling axis. And one obvious question is how such metabolic signaling is functioning in PSM patterning. And one simple idea I have is that this metabolic signaling may function as a coordinator or a function to coordinate tissue growth and patterning. But at the same time, I also think the link between metabolism and signaling is more general. So I want to explore its function beyond the mass PSM, in particular in the context of gene environment and interaction. In case of marbles, it is well known that maternal nutrition environment has a significant impact on embryonic phenotype. So here's the developmental plasticity questions. In external developing embryos like fish embryos, they are directly exposed to external environment and despite these environmental parameters are not stable over time, they, their development process happens very robustly. So there is a developmental robustness question here. And because metabolism is tightly linked to environment, my future goal is to explore the function of metabolism signaling axis in the context of plasticity and robustness using mice and fish models. And I would like to propose metabolism signaling axis as a mediator of gene environmental interaction. And with that, I'd like to thank my supervisor, Alexander Olela. And I also want to mention that the enjoyment part was done in close collaboration with previous student, Paul, and current student, Miona. And I also want to thank these all collaborators and funding source. And with that, I'm happy to take any questions. Thank you, Hidenovo, for a very nice, um, nice talk. Uh, feel free to ask questions through the Q&A box. If, if, I, if I may ask the, the first one, um, what, presumably as, as you were related to the kind of points that you were raising towards the end of your talk, there has to be a good reason to couple glycolytic flux with wind signaling and the subsequent patterning events. So in your mutant in which you were rescuing there, you were restoring wind signaling in, in, sort of in, in, in a situation in which glycolytic flux was not normal, but what are the consequences of doing that? Yeah, so that's a very good question. So until recently, I was not up paying attention to that, but my guess is, I guess some of my size is affected. I haven't quantified yet, but we have the data, so I want to quantify that. And then if there's any like disruption of scaling of some of my size in this context, I think that means this metabolic, metabolism signaling axis is functioning to coordinate tissue growth and patterning. So. I, I think it's a very good question. Thank, Thank you. you very much. Martin Esteban asks, it's interesting that glycolytic flux inhibits wind signaling. Do you have any insight on how this regulation occurs? Is it post-transcriptional, post-translational, or is it epigenetic? Um, it regulates wind expression or beta catenin which glycolytic products are important for this regulation. Well, thanks for the question. That's also a very good question. So currently we are thinking this glycolytic intermediate FPP is regulating wind signaling. And we are not looking at the epigenetics because the wind response happens very fast. So like for instance, after three hour culture, we already see a change in wind activity. So we are really thinking FPP is a key metabolite connecting glycolysis and wind signaling. And as a potential mechanism, I'm thinking maybe FPP function as a allosic regulator of signaling molecules. So to explore that, I'm now looking for like which protein can interact with FPP and maybe this interaction is regulating the activity of the signal molecules, and that is my current idea. One last question from Catherine Brown. Does the segmentation clock periodicity change over time? And if so, do you see changes in glycolytic flux during development that could help explain this? Yeah, so in the old literature, it is described that segmentation clock tempo gets slower over the time of like two days or three days. And we haven't looked at how metabolism changes in this context, but I think that could be a good, quite interesting point to look into. Thank you. 